Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. Good evening, everybody. I'm really uh, happy that you're here. A very warm welcome. My name is Anna Marijn Epker, and I am a program editor here at the Bali. And I make uh, a lot of programs on European issues these days. Um, the Bali is organizing many, many programs uh, in the coming weeks, and we did so in the past months as well, on uh, the upcoming European elections, and also on what it means to be European, uh, on the most important issues that we see happening in Europe at this moment. Um, and that's also the reason why I'm really, really happy that we have a very special guest in our midst uh, this evening, Timothy garson Ash, who will uh, be introduced more in detail uh, later on on in this program. But um, I'm really glad that we can do this with the support of the European Cultural Foundation as well. Um, and I wanted to draw your attention also to a specific campaign that the Bali is uh, co-organizing in the coming months. It's called uh, Votes Together, and Vote Together is an initiative that started during the Forum on European Culture in Amsterdam in 2016, which is a biannual forum on the value of culture for Europe. And uh, last year we, uh, we came together with more than 50 artists uh, from all over Europe, with designers, with speechwriters, with with activists um, that um, uh, got together to think about new ways of communicating Europe. And this turned out into a fantastic campaign with posters that have been translated into uh, uh, many all European languages, which you can see here uh, in the back but also in a campaign where we invite influential Europeans, uh, young people, to speak out on, uh, in favor of Europe. Sorry? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> but also young people, but also a bit uh, <laughs> older people. Um, to make people enthusiastic uh, about going to vote between the 23rd and the 26th of May. Um, so if you want to know more about this, um, you can go to the website votetogether.eu. You can download all those images which you could share uh, online on social media. You can order t-shirts uh, which you can post, um, uh, which you can uh, post online as well. Um, and yeah. That's, uh, uh, this is the website and the hashtag you could use. So I'm inviting you all to, uh, to uh, look at the website after this program and also really do something after you heard all these interesting uh, perspectives uh, tonight. So thank you very much. And I would like to uh, hand over the microphone to Marcia Luyte, who will moderate this evening. Thank you, thank you, Anne Marijn, and uh, welcome to all of you. It's fantastic that you've shown up such large numbers. Um, tonight, we want to have a diagnose, and we want to diagnose a current European disease, which is called Brexitosis. Brexitosis and 27 other varieties of European anger. We want to know what is going to happen with Brexit, and we want to know where is Europe heading? Um, how are we going to break the current deadlock? And on a wider scope, do we think European nations have 
Have they become complacent and have they uh, forgotten the lessons from the past? It's a, it's a great honor to have um, one of Europe's most lucid historians here tonight, um, Timothy Garten Ash. Welcome. Um, Timothy Garten Ash is a professor of European studies in the, in the University of Oxford, and he's a senior fellow in uh, California at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. And uh, during his life and career, he has been keen on living and working there where history was made, I dare say. In the 70s, he started as a scholar in West Berlin, then moved to, uh, to East Berlin and to Warsaw. And then this historian, he was foreseeing and witnessing an actual revolution. He reported then on the transformation after 1989. And he did that in Warsaw, Budapest, Berlin and Prague. And these were events that made him a true and spirited European. It was in the year that the war fell in 1989 that I was a novice student and I read his articles. And I must say, he's one of those rare authors that I still read today, 30 years on. In those years, he published 10 books of political writing and uh, the most recent one is called Free Speech. Free Speech, 10 Principles for a Connected World. And it is on that essential value that enables us to, uh, to have a free mind and that enables a true liberal democracy. He's also a weekly columnist for The Guardian and as such he's read worldwide. Today he doesn't have to travel so far to find himself in the midst of uh, historical European developments. <laughs> as a Brit he's of course close to the fire and he's reporting on and analysing Brexit. Um, tonight he will deliver the keynote speech, we're very happy with that, and afterwards he will discuss, discuss that with his European counterpart, I may say, with Paul Scheffer. Um, I'll introduce Paul a bit later, but before we start, Anne-Marijn already mentioned it, it's very important to note that this event is made possible by the European Cultural Foundation, and this foundation f uh, fosters citizens' understanding of the upcoming uh, European elections on May 23rd. Uh, we have another guest from across the channel. Um, she's a spoken word art artist. She's a poet, a writer, uh, a theatre maker. Um, she has been doing things for the BBC um, and she will tonight comment on the things that we will be discussing. Um, it's her second time performing in Amsterdam. Please give, give her a hand as she will kick off. Maddie Maxwell. Thank you so much. Hello. Um, it's really nice to be here. It's just nice to be out of London. Um, I was thinking when I was asked uh, to do this gig, I was like, how can I make this performance the most Brexit appropriate? Do I start and then try and leave and then ask you for more time? Like, I didn't really know. And then I was like, I'll leave it alone. But um, it is, it's quite a hard gig. Um, as a writer to be asked to write about Brexit and Europe, because as a writer, metaphor and imagery are, you know, what we use every day. And the discourse around Brexit has been so thick with metaphor. Um, we've had imagery of Europe as a broken family, um, going through a divorce, um, England as a kind of like disreputable friend who won't pay the bar bill. Um, I've heard people describe us as cancerous or even as like a tea bag in a cup of tea. And if you take the tea bag out, the whole tea goes weak and things like that. Um, and, and even the UK media especially, uh, there's a lot of imagery around uh, sort of war and the idea of if you are a Remainer, that you are betraying democracy. Um, and... I think there's a reason for this. I think in, it's interesting that in times of great change, we cling to metaphors, and metaphors give us uh, a sort of a sense of stability, and they help us make sense of the world, uh, and they feed into this desire for a narrative and a story and a beginning and a middle and an end. We know where the characters are. Um, and it's interesting to see what language does in, in crisis, and sometimes it feels like language just fails. Um, and when I was little, my mum and something went wrong, my mum would say to me, well, Maddie, it is what it is, and we are where we are. And, uh, and I always thought exactly, I was like, what is that supposed to mean? I, I just, absolutely meaningless. Um, and I still didn't understand it um, until Brexit happened. And then I was like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> So here we are, 27 metaphors for Brexit. It is what it is, 
We are where we are. Brexit means Brexit, and we're going to hell in a handcart. How do you like your Brexit in the morning? Hard Brexit? Soft Brexit? Medium rare Brexit? It doesn't matter because Brexit means breakfast. I mean Brexit. I mean, we don't want a continental Brexit. I don't know. We want a full English breakfast. Breakfast, but I don't know. I give up. Welcome to mid-Brexit Britain. Around us, there are rocks and there are hard places. There are poison chalices and albatrosses round people's necks. The blind are leading the blind into boats going up shit creek with no paddle, trying to weather the storm, while others sit on the fence, crying over spilt milk. There are bridges that are burning and houses made of cards. We're running off a track that was never beaten. There are bullets to bite and bitter pills to swallow and a cake that can be had but not eaten. In mid-Brexit Britain, we're hedging our bets. We're clutching at straws. We want to dance to the beat of our own drum. And so we'll aim to play for a jack of all deals and end up being master of none. In the kitchen, we want to wipe the slate clean because you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. But none of these words capture that moment in June, the visceral yet invisible gash that tore up the land, that ran across rivers and roads and cities and sand, like a root ripped up from under the ground, tearing right down the middle room. Sorry, right down the middle of your living room, splitting the sofa where you sit with your father so that all the stuffing pops out from the cushions between you. And you look at him and you say, you voted to leave, didn't you? And he says, well, yes, I did, as it happens. What have you got to say about it? And you say, well, I can't remember what there was to say, but it's never spoken of again. In mid-Brexit Britain, we speak only in the subjunctive tense, in woulds and coulds and what-ifs, Ours is the grammar of hope and hypotheticals, of indirect objects and dependent clauses, like trying to write a sentence without a verb. Just figures of state making figures of speech with a thousand empty words. Have we missed the boat? Did we ever have the ball in our court? Let's call a spade a spade. Here we are in mid-Brexit Britain and we're busy digging our own grave. Thank you, Manny. I must say, you're an excellent dancer on this rhythm of your own drama. And very happy that we're going to hear, you know, two more performances of you later on. Um, so we have this other guest from mid-Brexit Britain, um, Professor Gartenesh. It's an honor to invite you. Please give him a warm hand. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's fantastic to be back at the Bali. We were just recalling with Paul Schreffer that we were together here the first time, I think, 31 years ago in 1988, when everything in Europe looked so fantastically hopeful. Um, and so my image of Dabali is that it will be there forevermore, and even when Europe is in ruins and the Visigoths have overrun the rest of Europe, there'll still be this oasis of, of Europeanism. Um, actually, a, a friend of mine, a Hungarian historian, gave a rather sort of critical uh, lecture about Hungarian history. And at the end of it, a Hungarian nationalist historian um, got up and said that he didn't agree. And he said, I think we should be more optimistic about the past. <laughs> well, we can certainly be optimistic about the past. But what about the present? Now, I'm afraid you've been brought here on false pretenses because I see all this publicity saying, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen next in Brexit. I haven't the foggiest idea what's going to happen next idea. And let me tell you something else. No one else knows either. Um, I used to say only God alone knows what's going to happen next. But I recently concluded this is wrong because he doesn't know either. Um, and I don't think Theresa May knows um, because, and Maddie rather wonderfully evoked this in what she was saying, 
it, it's not that the country is split in two, because if it was split in two, you could find a solution. But the country is split in three. There, 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 there are sort of three tribes also in Parliament. Uh, sort of roughly speaking, Remain, which is me, hard Brexit over there, and a sort of very British soft middle for some sort of a compromise. Um, and um, that is why Parliament can't ever agree. There's actually, one or two of you may know, there's something called Condorcet's paradox, which is that if you have three uh, choices, A, B, and C, um, a, A can be preferred to B, B can be preferred to C, and C can be preferred to A, so you don't have a majority for everything, for anything. And that's rather the British position, that, 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 that we're stuck. But, so I can't tell you what's going to happen. I mean, you know, maybe there'll be the Labour Tory deal next week, and it'll go through Parliament, and we'll be out in June. Uh, I think it's very unlikely. But let me tell you what I want to happen. Because... As you said, I'm an English European, a lifelong English European, and I uh, basically dropped almost everything else for the last nine, nine months to try to get us a second referendum in which the Brits vote to remain in the EU. And the chances of that are going up and up the longer it takes. The longer it takes, the more probable that becomes. Uh, so we're really very grateful. I mean, I know you're completely fed up with this. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed anyone has come. I'm amazed you can stand to hear the word Brexit anymore. Um, but, but, but we are very grateful to you for giving us the, 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 the extra period. Um, the, the key difficulty is to get enough MPs to back it. And, and that means MPs voting their conscience and putting the national interest before the party interest and their own careers, which is a very difficult thing for politicians to do. Um, but, but that's the key. Once we get out there and get the campaign going, as long as we have a better campaign than we had last time, and the campaign, the Remain campaign in 2016 was pathetic, it was terrible. Um, um, I, 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 I'm quite confident. I mean, in, on the opinion polls, it's now about 55% for Remain and 45% uh, for, for, for Leave. Um, we're trying to teach the European elections as a sort of ersatz referendum, a pre-referendum. Um, so I'm also trying to get out the vote, getting people to register for vote, getting them to turn out. Um, but we have a big problem, which is called Jeremy Corbyn because in order for us to be able to say there was a majority in these elections for a second referendum and remain, we really needed Labour to take that position. And 80% of Labour Party members do take that position, but bloody Corbyn has stuck on the fence, with the fence stuck deep up his anatomy. <laughs> uh, um, uh, because, of course, he is at heart uh, 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 what we call a Lexiteer, left-wing Brexiteer. He has always been a Eurosceptic, and he's also worried about the very pro-Leave constituencies in the north of England. So that's all I'm going to say about the question you thought you were going to hear answered, because I have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, what I want to talk about is Brexitosis. In other words, about Brexit in the wider European context. So, so Brexitosis is, of course, a reference to halitosis, which, how many people know what halitosis is? Yeah, a lot of you do, I can see. It's bad breath. And bad breath, of course, comes when you have a disorder in the body. Um, and um, there's a lot of bad breath about Europe at the moment, and not just in Britain. And brexitosis is just one version of the halitosis which we're seeing right across the continent. And I want to put basically just two propositions to you uh, and then shut up and go into the conversation. Um, so the first proposition is that Brexit is fundamentally a deeply European phenomenon and not some peculiar English eccentricity, which is how it's often treated in, in, in media coverage, right? So, so obviously, 
there are elements of it which are peculiarly, and I mean peculiarly, English. I, I don't think any other country could produce William Rees Mogg. I mean, uh, Jacob Rees Mogg, the, the honorable member for the, for the 18th century. <laughs> a man said to wear double breasted pajamas. Uh, and, and there's all that stuff. Um, and, 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 um, and obviously, the, 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 the Britain is a series of islands, although you can read that two ways. You can read it the way Shakespeare reads it in The Scepted Isle, but you can also think about water not as a barrier, but as a highway, something that connects. And actually, for much of our history and our shared history, Dutch English history, water was a highway, something that connected, not divided. So I don't pay much attention to that. Um, more serious uh, is something which I think is peculiarly English. I, I had a radio discussion on the BBC with a guy who's actually a, a lifelong Eurosceptic, but a, a kind of friend of mine called Charles Moore. And we were each asked to name one date that we thought was really significant from British history for, for Brexit. You would never guess it. Have a guess at what date. Anyone like to guess at what date most relevant for Brexit? 1066. Give, give, 1066, go on. 1066. Entry into the EU. Entry into the EU, 1973. Any advance on 1973? 92, Maastricht. That's a quite a good get. So 45 was mine, because actually, from my point of view, the, the, the big change in the British approach to Europe was not 1973, it was 1945, when at the end of the Second World War, which we fought together, the Brits decided to stay and join other people in Europe in trying to make a better Europe. And they made what the military historian Michael Howard called the continental commitment. We had never had a standing army on the continent of Europe since we lost Calais in the 16th century, most regrettably. Uh, um, uh, but since 45, you know, we, we've, we've had a standing, there's been a standing permanent British military force and a British permanent commitment, which is of course still there. And now they're not in West Germany, they're in Estonia. So what kind of a retreat from Europe is that when you've got your own troops committed you know, in three musketeers, fat and, you know, one for all to protect Estonia. So the 45 was mine. No, but Charles Moore's 1533. Anyone know what was 1533? Any historians in the room? I bet there is someone. Very good. So the Henrician Reformation, and because Henry VIII wanted to get another divorce and the Pope wouldn't give it him, he, he had a reformation. It's not like your Dutch reformation, which was a serious reformation, but this is not about religion or anything. It was just about Henry VIII. Um, and, and he passed something called the Act in Restraint of Appeals to Rome, 1533, which says there is no higher legal authority than the realm of England. And then it contains the famous sentence, this realm of England is an empire. But not an empire in the sense of colonies, but in the sense of the legal sovereign, like the Holy Roman Empire. And actually this friend of mine has a point because from that 1533 on, you can date this peculiar English, not Scottish, not Irish, specifically English obsession, with purely legal sovereignty, right? So the English are just obsessed with the European Court of Justice, the ECJ, right? And that's something which is quite deep in the English tradition. It goes all the way back to this idea. Of course, effective sovereignty is a completely different matter. We're actually going to be losing a lot of effective sovereignty, but strictly legal sovereignty. Uh, uh, parliamentary sovereignty, too. A um, few other elements, but the large forces, the large forces that turn 20% into 52% are forces which you have in the Netherlands and you see all over the continent. Um, they're the forces of populism. And if you ask what's driving them, my answer is, in the words of a great 
French writer and friend of mine called Pierre Asner, who in 1991 wrote a really prophetic text. 91, 89, fall of the Berlin Wall, velvet revolutions, end of the Soviet Union, hooray, hooray, we all celebrated in Dubai and elsewhere. And he said, let us not forget that as we celebrate the triumph of uh, liberty, uh, that uh, human beings do not live by liberty and universality alone. And he went on, the yearnings that gave us nationalism and socialism, the yearning for community and identity on the one side, and solidarity and equality on the other, have not disappeared. And that is the most brilliant and prescient analysis of why we are where we are today all across Europe the yearning for community and identity, which has people going back to the nation, to community, to family, to tribe, against all this liberal, technocratic, transnational stuff, and solidarity and equality, which has been, let's admit, drastically neglected in 30 years of globalized, financialized capitalism and neoliberalism, of which the EU is seen to be an engine. And the EU is particularly vulnerable to the classic populist critique of the people, you have it here too, versus the liberal technocratic elites. Because those people in Brussels, well, I guess you're physically a bit closer to them here, but they're a long way away and they are quite remote they are quite technocratic, they are quite liberal, they are elites, and the European Parliament often looks like a bubble within the Brussels bubble, um, and it has this sense of de haut en bas, of an enlightened elite telling other people what is good for them, um, and it's identified with that whole agenda which people are rejecting. Um, so, so that's my first argument, which I'd love to discuss, which is that Brexit is not just a peculiar English phenomenon. It is just one example of something that you see in Hungary, Salvini's Italy, Kaczynski's Poland, Herr Wilders and the, the, the Forum for Democracy here, AfD in Germany, Marine Le Pen in France, who, by the way, Marine Le Pen in France, in the opinion polls currently running neck and neck with Macron for the European elections, she may actually be ahead of him. So don't tell me it's just an East European thing or just an English thing. Um, and of course, uh, Brexit is also quite European in that, um, oh my God, there she is. Uh, God, that's rather unsettling to come on screen at that moment. God, I really have an allergic reaction when I hear. <laughs> now let me turn away. Um, uh, but, but, but the other irony of Brexit is, is that while there was a little bit of it, which was sort of transatlantic, neoliberal, you know, let's be a, 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 an offshore Switzerland, Singapore on the Thames, you know, low tax, deregulated, buccaneering, neo-Elizabethan, what was the great slogan of the campaign? The com so slogan of the campaign was um, 350 million pounds for the National Health Service. 350 million pounds a week for the National Health Service. What could be more European than wanting to have a strong National Health Service? So the irony of the story is what, you know, that the Brexiteers are proposing that we should leave Europe in order to be more European. So that's my first point. My second point is, and, and this I think may surprise you, but I genuinely believe it, uh, and, and I'd love to talk about it some more, I actually think that at the end of the day, in 10 or 15 years' time, if Brexit happens, which I hope it doesn't, and, and doing everything to prevent it, it could be even more damaging for the European Union than it is for Britain. Surprising thought? Well, let me try and explain. So, um, clearly it's going to be very... It's already bad for Britain. We've already, actually, on the economic calculations, Remember 350 million a week for the National Health Service? On the figures, the best figures estimates so far, because of the, the relative 
decline in, in GDP growth, we've already lost, on some estimates, 600 million a week. Uh, so, you know, it's gone the other way. The NHS is desperately short of qualified staff because all the continental European staff are either leaving or, or not applying for the jobs. Uh, investment has frozen, which will have a very bad impact on the economy. Even in my university, Oxford, um, I mean, I hope you won't take this a, the wrong way, but if I tell you that I have Italian colleagues who are seriously thinking of coming back to Italian public universities, you'll understand how bad things are <laughs> if you know an Italian public university. No, no offense to Italian universities. Uh, but because, not because objectively they, they would be in a bad situation in Oxford, but, but because subjectively they just feel it's not a welcoming place. So it's going to be really bad for us. And of course, our, uh, you know, we've become an international laughing stock. It's really quite painful. Uh, we've made ourselves ridiculous. Uh, our influence is completely tanked in Washington and anywhere else. So it's going to be bad for us. But I think it could be even worse for the European Union. And let me just sort of try out the argument on you and then, and then please try and persuade me that I'm wrong because I'd be very glad if I'm wrong. First of all, it's quite clear that if you look at it in cold analytical terms, we are living through a period of European disintegration more than integration. Putin taking great chunks out of Ukraine, Trump turning away from the transatlantic West, U.S. support has been important for the European project. Uh, Viktor Orban has destroyed liberal democracy in Hungary. Kaczynski is trying to do the same in Poland. Savini, next Saturday, the 18th of May, is going to have a great gathering of all the nationalist populists in Milan. Salvini, Orban, the alliance. Nationalist populists, wherever you look, polling 20%, 30%, 35%. Uh, the Eurozone, the great divide between North and South. It cannot be good at such a moment to lose one of the largest member states in the European Union, however troublesome a member state it was. And one of the things it does is to remove the sense of the European project as a story of progress, right? So until recently, I think most of us thought of the European project as something that was steadily progressing, more integration, more unification, more enlargement, more deepening what I call the nimbus of irreversibility. The nimbus of irreversibility is now destroyed when a major, major state leaves. Second of all, don't believe anyone who tells you, including that woman who was up there a moment ago, that once we've left, it's all going to be sweetness and light and honky-dory and lovely trans-channel cooperation for the birds, tell that to the marines. It's not what's going to happen. The actual leaving will be very difficult, for starters. We haven't even started the economic relationship. When we have left, uh, the initial period will be very tough indeed for us. And therefore, the Brexiteers who made all these false promises and the Eurosceptic press will have to blame it on somebody. So, of course, they'll blame it on the bloody Europeans. And in particular, the French, obviously. Something the English have been doing for 700 years. So we have quite a lot of, of practice in it. The Germans always think that the Brits are just sort of very anti-German. This is not true at all. They're anti-French. I once had a conversation with an old Conservative MP who was complaining to me that Margaret Thatcher was very uh, anti-German. And I said to him, yes, but Jim, she's also anti-French. And he said, oh, that's all right. <laughs> Which is just a classic English reaction. And it's friendly rivalry. But anyway, they'll blame it. And Macron actually offers himself up as a perfect sort of Napoleonic target. And they will get traction. So there will be a lot of bad blood uh, and, and the blame game. Do not tell me that in such a situation, the realm of foreign and security policy and domestic security and intelligence cooperation, where actually you need Britain quite a bit, is going to be wonderfully unaffected by this. It's somehow going to sail on totally unaffected. 
nonsense. That's not how real politics work. When you have a, you know, a hard Brexiteer prime minister, those areas will be affected too. And what that means is, I was just having a conversation with our friends from the European Council on Foreign Relations, of which I'm a founding member. The European Council on Foreign Relations set out more than 10 years ago to get a more coherent, more effective European foreign policy to deal with China, to deal with Russia, to deal with the United States, to deal with the challenge of climate change. We haven't got very far and we're not going to get very far if you take out a country like Britain. So that's not going to go very well. In addition to which, in addition to which, taking Britain out of the mix. I, I'm trying my argument out on you in the, in the hope, as I say, that between you, you can prove me wrong. In addition to which, somehow that triangle between France, Germany, and Britain helped to keep complex balances in the rest of the EU. Does that ring a bell? So Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, free market liberal, more etatist, all of those balances were somehow kept in place with this triangle. Take Britain out and you're left with France and Germany and that becomes much more difficult. So just to give you one quick example, Alice Weidel of the AfD, a very nasty party, but a clever, intelligent, uh, quite deadly speaker, gave a really killer speech in the Bundestag attacking Angela Merkel for allowing Brexit to happen. And she said, we're going to have to pay more and we're going to be left alone with Club Med left by France. And Britain takes away our blocking minority uh, on, on the basis of population. Those kind of arguments you're going to hear much more of. And then so much then depends on the Franco-German couple who are not doing so absolutely great at the moment. And so much then comes back to Germany. And already Germany is, to use that wonderful German word, word etwas überfragt. Too much already is being asked, in my view, of Germany, uh, to which the political class and public opinion are not really you know, ready to, to, to pay up and step up to the plate. Um, if you take Britain out of the picture, even more is asked of Germany, and I'm not persuaded that Germany is really ready to take up that burden. So that's my rather pessimistic analysis. As I say, I'd love to be proved wrong in the discussion, but in the meantime, there are signs of hope. One of them was that the largest pro-European demonstration in recent European history happened in London on the 23rd of March. A sea of European flags around the Duke of Wellington's house in the centre of London. People wearing T-shirts saying, I'm a citizen of Europe. Tremendous pro-European mobilisation. Another is the Spanish election result, which is really quite encouraging and for now this is the first I would say election to the European Parliament which all over Europe really is about Europe it's a crucial election and we all have to, have to get out and vote so it's not aux armes citoyens it's aux own citoyens thank you very much Thank you. I think we've got plenty to discuss about. Um, you said there's some sparks of hope. Um, was it also um, the tremendous loss that Theresa May incurred last week when she lost these local elections um, and the Lib Dems and the Greens won? Was that for you a sign of hope? Um, well, it's a sign of desperation uh, in the Conservative Party. Uh, and it's also a sign of something else, which I think is really rather paradoxical, which is um, it's taken Brexit to Europeanise British politics. Right? So you have this fragmentation of your party landscape, which is characteristic for much of Europe at the moment. In, in Britain, in the last election, the two big parties were still holding up their vote share. Now both big parties were punished, and we have this fragmentation of the vote. But... Um, 
I'm quite worried about where that takes us in the European elections because so many votes will go across to the Brexit party from the Tories. And my side of the argument, the pro-Remain side of the argument, is split between these five parties, Lib Dems, the new party Change UK, uh, the Greens, uh, Scottish National Party and Plaid Cymru in Wales. You know the old saying that when Liberals form a firing squad, they do it in a circle. And, and I, I'm rather sadly reminded of that when I look at the Remain parties lining up to shoot each other. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned a few things. You said um, we do, we, there's some things we don't understand. For, for instance, we always underestimate how bad Brexit will be for the rest of uh, continental yeah. Europe. Um, here's the thing that I haven't understood by looking at this Brexit, because such, such a really strong narrative is the elite versus the people. Whereas the people who are talking about the elite and accusing the elite are extremely elitist themselves, thinking of Rees Mogg and Boris Johnson. Uh, both, um, yeah, they both come from Eton, they've studied at, at Oxford. Uh, how do you explain for that? Why are they trusted on that argument? But that's true everywhere. Kaczynski is a professor. Viktor Orban went to Oxford, highly educated guy. Marine Le Pen is not exactly, you know, wasn't a toiling peasant farmer until she became a politician. I mean, I mean that's characteristic of populism. Populism consists in one part of the elite attacking the other part of the elite in the name of the people. So I, I, I don't think it's peculiar so it's to us, although I have to no. admit that the idea of Boris Johnson as a horny-handed son of toil does stretch the imagination, yes. <laughs> but you say... Um, horny, maybe, but not horny-handed. <laughs> maybe you say it's not peculiar for Britain, but still, um, it's puzzling, isn't it? Well, I don't think it is puzzling, because uh, uh, populism... Well, populism is many things, but one thing is it, it's a, a technique of political entrepreneurs who see that in a given society, and in many of our societies, there are four or five groups of unhappy people who actually have different interests and different grievances. So how are you going to pull together all these different groups with their different grievances? Mm. Answer by making this incredibly strong, simplistic, emotionally appealing nationalist narrative. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and to sort of develop that technique, you need to be, to be quite a skillful, you know, skillful and perhaps cynical politician. C cynical as well, you say it's very... Well, I wouldn't... Mm. Know. Who knows what is in the heart of Nigel Farage? <laughs> <laughs> but what you just picture, um, these emotional arguments, um, they seem to appeal also to something bigger than just... Um, you know, little um, uh, tactical political arguments. They seem to appeal to, yeah, uh, the people are looking for a certain meaning. Do you see it that way, that they look for meaning in that nation that gives them something bigger than themselves? I don't think meaning is the right word. I think Pierre Asnard had the right community and identity. People felt that in all this change in globalization, Europeanization, immigration, all the other Asians, that things were just changing too far and too fast. Mm -hmm. And they reach back for familiar identities and familiar communities. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's... And so the lesson for, for us liberals, I'm, I'm definitely a liberal with a small L, is not necessarily that the direction of travel was wrong, because I don't think it was, but certainly the speed of travel was too fast. It was just too much. I mean, I campaigned for Remain in the 2016 referendum. And my campaigning consisted of talking to Asian British, often Muslim uh, uh, Brits in the east of Oxford, which is a poorer part of Oxford, who were complaining to me about the bloody foreigners. And the bloody foreigners were Poles and Lithuanians. In other words, they were white Christian Europeans. So it's a, it's a kind of ironical tribute to the success of British integration poli policy that Muslim Asian Brits can complain about bloody foreigners who are white Christian Europeans. Mm. Um, but, but, but that tells you something, because those people who came from South Asia could, by definition, they could not be racist, 
because they and their children had experienced racism on their own skin. So it wasn't racism, it wasn't xenophobia in the classic sense. And then what did but it, it tell was, you? No, but what it did tell me was that you had well over two million East Europeans who had come to Britain in the last uh, 10 plus years, and uh, the schools were overcrowded, the hospitals were overcrowded, the social housing was under stress, some of the jobs had gone to these people, and it was an understandable, it was just too much, too fast. Mm -hmm. So that is migration, you say? Internal European migration So, so I mean, this is of course Paul Schaffer's great, exactly. great <laughs> theme, but, but, but I think it's... it's um, you had my friend Michael Ignatiev up on the screen, so that Canada is really interesting, because we did a study at Oxford about... Uh, success in integrating immigrants, five leading Western democracies, US, Britain, France, U US, Canada, France, Germany, and Britain. Guess who came out top? Canada, of course. And this is partly because Canadians are wonderful, tolerant, multicultural, etc., etc. people. All of this is true. But it's also because it's the only one of those five countries which actually manages its immigration policy mm -hmm. in great detail and controls its borders. And because it manages its immigration and controls its policy, people feel relaxed about immigration mm -hmm. and they don't mind if the country takes in more people. So this is where take back control yeah. was such a brilliant slogan. So it wasn't, it was partly about the scale and speed, but also about the sense that it wasn't managed, it wasn't under control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss migration further on with Paul, if you don't mind, because he of course, of course. Uh, is a specialist on this topic. Um, you said people were reaching back to identities they'd known before and that would, um, uh, you know, provide them with um, um, yeah, a stable identity, something they could um, identify themselves with. But um, I was wondering, this, if you, you said Brexitosis is a phenomenon rather than, uh, than the UK, um, everywhere in Europe you see that these populist parties, they use a vocabulary um, of uh, regeneration. If you look at Forum for Democracy, they talk about the Renaissance, take back control was such a slogan. Um, Make America Great Again is another one. Um, this goes back to a very old political and, and religious narrative. Some people, some ant anthropologists say to the oldest political narratives, uh, that if anthropologists look at, at old clan rituals, this is what they talk about, about a Renaissance taking, uh, being great again, taking back to what they had. Um, you said it, it's not about meaning, but isn't this still about looking for a meaning then? I'm not, again, I'm not sure that meaning is the right word here, but, but, but um, I mean, and those slogans, and one could add Marine Le Pen, on est chez nous, which is what they on chanted. Chez the yeah. rallies, yeah. on est chez nous, and, and, and in Poland, it's dobra zmiana, a good change. And what these slogans have in common is they make you feel warm and uh, inside and, and a little bit angry together with other people, um, but they don't actually say very much because you're having to unite all these different social groups with their different, so they have this vagueness, a sort of warm vagueness, um, you know, warm, warm vagueness in common. But, but, but also, I think we liberals, Europeans, internationalists, made a mistake over the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, our mistake was not to talk so much about Europe internationalism, global challenges, cosmopolitanism, multiculturalism, and all of that, our mistake was to talk too little about the nation yeah. and about older communities. And we left the nation to the right and the reactionaries and the nationalists. And so it was waiting there, this enormously potent thing, yeah. to be picked up by people like Trump and, and Farage and Le Pen. And, and do you feel that on the left, there is these days a new narrative being made where this is incorporated? So, I mean, Macron is a little bit down at the moment because of Gilets Jaunes and all that. Yeah. But he certainly tried. He certainly yeah. tried and I really admired, you know, his famous phrase is en même temps. We do Europe, but en même temps, at the same time, we do the nation. We're proud of France and we're proud of Europe. And I think that's the right way to go and to develop a language of liberal patriotism. Yeah. So that I think, I mean, I think he's a positive example of that. His trouble is, of course, that if, if, if people are rebelling against 
you know, liberal elites. He's a sort of personification of a liberal mm. elite, Cause even if he ev abolishes the A now from which he came. But yes. even this narrative doesn't resonate. He is failing in that respect, isn't he? Well, <laughs> whether he's failing, uh, well, we'll see. The jury is out, isn't it? I mean, he's mm. certainly taken a big hit. And it is, of course, a supreme irony that um, <laughs> the man who was Mr. Europe, who was uh, like talking about Europe like no other European politician now has to spend all his time at home, home in local town halls. But in a way, that's the right thing because one thing I was talking about earlier today is, um, you know, another mistake we made, I think, is to spend a lot of our time talking about Europe in other people's countries. How and do you in, mean? In nice places like the Bali rather than talking about Europe back home, in provincial towns, in our own countries, in our own languages, to the people who really needed persuading. So that is actually something you, uh, you blame the European elite for? Well, starting with myself, yes, absolutely. I mean, I don't want to say that I shouldn't be here, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's another thing you mentioned, that was like the British Empire. and. Um, I read in your work that you said this, that is something that we haven't understood uh, thoroughly, that how important this idea is of a lost empire. Huh? Um, is that something that goes for Europe in general as well? Yes. Um, I, I mean, I don't know what the case is in, in, in the Netherlands and whether you have really worked through your imperial history uh, in we satisfactory haven't. fashion. <laughs> I, I hear the hint of an answer in the audience reaction there. A little more Geschichtsaufarbeitung to be done. <laughs> um, but, but it is worth pointing out that, you know, when, when the European Union, what is now the European Union, was founded, uh, the founding members were still imperial countries. I mean, France still had colonies, or immediately post-imperial mm -hmm. countries. And so the idea when we go back now to, quote unquote, the nation state, well, we're not actually going back because that's not what, we, what were we were before when we joined. No. Um, but, but I think it's a particularly British problem. So I think it was Johnson or Michael Gove who in their article saying they were coming out for Brexit actually had a sentence which said something like, they say we can't manage on our own, but we, we rule the greatest empire the world has ever seen. So who says we can't be okay on our own? Yeah. So that, you know, I think, the, I think there are very few other countries in Europe which would have the kind of self-confidence to think, wrongly, but to think that they could be okay on their own. Mm. And I think that does have to do with, not just with the imperial legacy, but with the failure to actually confront the imperial legacy. But the same argument that we've lost the empire in 45 or in the 50s was a very strong argument in favor of, European, of integrating the UK into Europe. Yeah, so... So how did that... Th th that's get? a really, really interesting point. So that, remember we were taken into... In, into the European community by conservatives. Labour was then the Eurosceptic party, and these were people who, you know, fought in the Second World War, known Britain still as an imperial power. And their argument was, Britain has to be a great power. We can't, can no longer be a great power on our own, therefore we have to go into Europe to be a great power with others. In fact, there's an almost parodic moment which Willy Brandt recalls in his memoirs, when George Brown, who was then the British Foreign Secretary, when Britain was trying to join, actually said to him, Willy, or he probably said Willy, uh, Willy, you must get us in so we can take the lead. <laughs> I mean, this just sums it all up, the British attitude, this obsession with leadership. What you have now, with, with actually many of the elite Brexiteers, apart from this kind of delusional self-confidence that we'll be all right on our own, is actually something very unusual in the history of the Conservative Party, which is, okay, so we're not going to be a great power anymore. So be it. We just want to be rich and free. Hmm. Offshore Switzerland, 
That's fine by us. Talking with Maddie Maxwell, it is as it is. Well, uh, yeah, well, it's not quite it is as it is, because as it is... We have to Germ take it Britain, as... Britain is actually a rather major part, you know, and this is a joke that Britain actually has had disproportionate influence inside the EU, particularly, well, in lots of areas, but particularly in foreign policy, where it's often shaped the agenda. So it isn't it is as it is. Um, but it's OK if we're just rich and free and we're not ruling the waves anymore, so be it. Yeah. Um, you just say um, it's delusional, this idea that um, Britain can still, you know, be on its own and, you know, be just as um, rich and happy. Um, I was wondering, if you talk about delusional politics, I have the sense that it is everywhere. If I look at Theresa May, I get that sense every time. Every time again, she, there's a defeat, political defeat for her, just like the local elections uh, last uh, Thursday. And then she says... I take this as an encouragement to uh, move on with my Brexit. Um, so I was just wondering, do you have an idea why we have come, and, and you know, you can give plenty of examples of how delusional politics works. Can you explain for how we've come so receptive for disillusional politics and, and these illusions? So, first of all, I think Theresa May is sort of in a class of her own. I mean, she, and, and I don't mean that unkindly. I mean, she is just a very unusual kind of human being. I mean, how someone can just take so many hits, knock down again, and still get up with a different dress and, you know, yeah. scarf and jewellery on, and say exactly the same thing as if nothing has changed. I mean, it is an unbelievable. It's like a theatre, actually. It's something for Maddie. Yeah. I mean, it's a sort of surreal theatre. But, but she's still there, so there must be support. Well, but she's only still there. That's a sort of miracle of physics, as it were, because... <laughs> be, 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 because... I, I can't quite... Uh, maybe there's a physicist in the room, but <laughs> there are these two factions in the Conservative Party and neither wants the other to win. And so she is a feather on the balance, as it were, and even she herself weighs nothing uh, now. She's just <laughs> in the balance, right? So, so that, that's a slightly different thing. But I think the delusional politics, you know, takes us to another aspect of populism, yeah. which is the famous echo chamber effects on the internet and the constant repetition of lines which, you know, as Goebbels suggested, you know, the lie becomes effective by sheer repetition. And in this case, it isn't the monopoly lie, mm -hmm. but it's the monopoly lie within the echo chambers of your side of the argument. And I, I think that's a slightly different phenomenon, actually. Different from? D well, different from the Theresa May thing. OK, but then still, why are we so receptive to delusional politics? Why is that echo well, chamber so powerful? Who's we in this? We, we uh, Europeans in general. I'm not sure that we are. I'm not, I'm not sure that we are. Um, you say Brexitosis is like, uh, it's emblematic yeah, for what is happening in the rest yeah, of yeah, Europe. No, no, but, it's, 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 it, but, 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 but Brexitosis, I mean, I come back to the image of halitosis, of the bad breath. Hmm. It's the expression, as it were, the emanation of, of problems in the stomach or wherever else bad breath comes from. Don't ask me, I'm not a doctor. But wherever else, in other words, it's an, in some sense, it's an epiphenomenon, right? So one has to look and see what are the causes of it, I think. Um, and by the way... Well, you are a master surgeon tonight, so is there like a, a simple answer to that? No, I don't have a simple answer to it. But, but, but I'll tell you one thing, I mean... While there are these echo chamber effects and they, they, they help to explain populism, um, we, we have to be careful not to make too sweeping generalizations. I've looked at this a lot because of my work on free speech and the position seems to be roughly this. Most of these people, most of the people in this room, like you and me, who are super intelligent, open-minded, uh, interested, curious people, actually get a greater diversity of views because of the internet. Because it's so easy to find different sources and different viewpoints. So it actually increases the pluralism we get from the internet. It's the people at the two ends of the spectrum, right, uh, who are seeking similar views to reinforce their own. So it's a bit more complicated. So you don't believe in that filter bubble there? Well, I don't believe in the filter bubble, because I think the filter bubble is a different thing from the echo chamber, but I do believe in the echo chamber. That is to say, people 
who want to believe that um, the EU is run by the Freemasons can go online and find 237 other websites which confirm beyond all reasonable doubt that the EU is run by Freemasons. Mm. Um, you just said um, the elections on the 23rd of May, they will be like a second referendum, you hope. Um, so that makes it meaningful. So if the outcome is that a majority votes for, say, Lib Dems and Greens, so the, the Leave parties, then you're a happy man the next day. Will that really make a difference? So, you know, I, 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 think, I think how the story gets told is kind of important, isn't it? I mean, Sp Spain, for example, if you looked at it with a very cold eye, you could just say, well, in Spain, the left and the right are unusually solid blocks. Actually, in the elections, both left and right each got 43%. It just so happened that the right was divided between three parties and the left only between two. So it looked as if the you know, socialists have done particularly well. Um, nonetheless, the story gets told as, hooray, the Social Democrats are winning at last, the Social Democrats are coming back. And in, in the British context, if we could start to tell a story about how pro-Remain parties were doing very well, that would be very helpful in convincing these lily-livered MPs to do the right thing, you know. Um, but because of Labour, I think it's going to be difficult. Okay, well, let's hope the story told will be a good one. Um, we'll leave it here for now because we've got um, a second spoken word performance by Maddie Maxwell. Maddie, please take the floor. Thank you. Um, God, it's so hard to focus on what I am actually doing when I'm listening to such. Uh, amazing insights, and I've got to say, some of the most savage descriptions of Theresa May I have ever heard. And it's gonna, it's gonna keep me going for a long time. Um, I'm going to read a piece now, um, a slightly longer piece about um, my identity as a as a European, um, and sort of, um, I suppose, citizenship more more broadly. Um, I hadn't really considered myself European, even though my mum's parents are French, until I was asked this time last year to come and write about Europe. And then I um, was sort of having to dig in my own family history. And it was around that time that I also managed to secure a French passport, um, which is great. So I actually don't give a shit about Brexit, because I'm fine. Um, but here we are. When I was younger than I am now, but the oldest I was back then, I'd spend summers in the Côte d'Azur. I'd sit sipping rosé at 11 a.m. and listen to the language that pulls my lips into new shapes while cicadas fill the silence. And whenever I could, I'd sneak off and buy gouloirs from the tabac because smoking in French is cool. And in the supermarché, my Yankee uncles couldn't believe that there was dairy produce that actually came from a cow. And there was an entire aisle dedicated to yogurt. Throughout the day, assorted relatives would arrive unannounced on a daily basis and just sort of plop into the pool. More rosé was opened. My great aunts would tell a classic joke about a Belgian monk driving backwards up a hill, don't ask. And then later on, we'd pile into cars and go to my aunt's house for some bouillabaisse and unsolicited personal remarks. My uncle brings out his homemade hooch. He pulls a thimbleful from a crystal decanter and we knock it back out of politeness. It tastes like nail varnish remover, only not quite as sweet. Someone lights a cigar and the smoke hangs in the heat. The conversation turns to politics. My French family are absolutely furious with us about Brexit. Mais qu'est-ce que vous avez fait alors? C'est une absolument bêtise, quoi. I made a joke and say, well, it's not awful, don't shoot the messenger, but they don't find it funny. My uncle José comes from Martinique where he made a living making neon signs that did nothing to illuminate his view of black people or women. And next to him sits Uncle Jacques in his 80s, and he tells me how he lost his eye, his, uh, his house, and most likely his marbles, in the Algerian War of Independence. He is one of the Pieds Noirs, born in Algeria under French rule. His accent is strong and southern, Marseillaise, vowels shaped like parallelograms. And he leans in and he says, écoute-moi. 
moi, je ne suis pas raciste, mais c'est vrai. Les musulmans ne travaillent pas. He pours pastis over ice and it turns cloudy and white. And in the bathroom of this holiday house, there is a curtain. Not iron, but plastic, a shower curtain with a map of the world on it. And I stand inside and I look out at the continents through mottled drops of lime scale. And the next day I swim in the Mediterranean. I lie on my back and I look at the clouds. My limbs float like pasta in salty water. And I have no fear. The water works for me. Later on, my brother and I walk up the hill from the beach and crash straight into the pool with our clothes on. I relish the chlorine sluice, the soft bleach between my teeth. Struggling under the weight of wet cotton is fun. We capsize each other from the inflatable dinghy, struggling under the weight. And we're laughing and squealing and fake drowning. And the sand from the beach floats from my feet down to the bottom of the pool like dead skin and cut scenes. This is what it means to be white European, to cross between the wet and the dry, between the sea and the sky, between verbs and their past participles, landing strips and customs officials, borders, nothing but sliding doors onto balconies of apartments that they will not think twice about renting to you not thronging in a boat made of air when the sea turns stern, pleading with the Mediterranean, with its green eyes and bad temper to welcome you onto its shores, because if your skin is not pasta, the sand will not extend its hand to greet you. Drain yourself, it says, since you invited yourself onto the plate. What does it matter if you are inside or out if you are always above suspicion? Do we mean Caucasian when we say continental? who belongs in our national nostalgia? Is it only for those for whom Paris is a city in which to lock lips on a padlocked bridge, not home to the gilets jaunes and bonfires in the banlieue? Are we saying that, quite frankly, mi casa is not su casa, and we will keep this collective selective? Thank you, Maddie Maxwell. Um, it's time to invite now our third guest, Paul Schaeffer, already mentioned him. And he is every inch, I can say, a counterpart of Timothy Gartenash. They've got the same age, we just discovered. Um, they met here in 1988 in the Bali. Um, Paul is um, a professor of European studies as well, then at the University of Tilburg in Amsterdam. And he was a correspondent in Eastern Europe in, um, in Warsaw, it was, yes, after having been a correspondent in, um, in Paris. And that's where you two met already. So, um, welcome. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. You've been listening to uh, Timothy Garten Ash. Um, what was like the main thing that you disagree about? That's a difficult question. I would like to begin, um, if you allow me, by saying it's a great pleasure to. Um, talk to Timothy Gartenesh again. Um, my thoughts went back to Warsaw in 1980 because I think it's for both of us a defining experience. Um, be, having been in Paris um, and later on in Warsaw learned me something uh, about Europe, which uh, Timothy Gartenesh touched upon as well. And that is you cannot understand Europe if you don't try to see Europe, what it is from a perspective of Warsaw, Paris, Rome, London, but also The Hague. So when I came back after all these travels through Europe, I started to look differently at the Netherlands and not buying anymore this illusion we got about ourselves as being entirely pro-European, being a country without borders, losing ourselves as an avant-garde of European history in a wider world, because then I saw that the European policy of the Netherlands, and there I touch upon the question of Brexit, was so ambivalent, because on the one hand, we were very pro-European, very federalist, and at the same time, opposing the goal in the 60s, the French president, with the préalable anglais, 
French was at the time the um, manner language. of speech of diplomats. And um, the Préalable Anglais basically said to the Gaulle, we're not going to go any further with political integration in Europe and political cooperation in Europe unless Britain joins Europe. So if we want to measure what we're about to lose, also from a Dutch perspective, it's exactly that. that the Netherlands, but also many other European countries, lived by this triangle, this subtle, very complex uh, equilibrium between Paris, uh, Bonn, later on Berlin, and London. And so losing Britain for a country like the Netherlands, which always had this anti-continental streak, mm. And are you By saying that w wanting Britain to be a counterbalance to France and Germany now finds itself in a very different position, like Poland, like Italy. So this triangle, we're going to lose so much more than only 30 great universities, a security presence of Britain in Europe, etc., etc. But this whole shifting of the balance of Europe is definitely something that's going to haunt us for a much longer time than we now think. This is not a disagreement. I'm sorry. But can I, can I jump in there? So what does the Netherlands then do? When, well, if Britain has left, not uh, when, if. Well, the answer is very simple. Uh, überfragen. <laughs> we want <laughs> Germany. Yes, I do befragen. We <laughs> want Germany to do far more. So uh, our prime minister goes to Berlin, uh, just the minister of finance today giving big speeches of saying Germany should shoulder more responsibility. But and we is, all know that That Europe is at a, at a moment in time, Paul, that Germany is getting back to an Alleingang. So um, well, the, 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 the movement they make now is reverse. No, I don't think Germany is, is going to an Alleingang. No, but it's, it definitely, is, it's definitely struggling, redefining its position yeah. on the European continent, yeah. Yeah. with on the one hand seeing that Britain is fading away. We'll see how it works because we're still in the midst of all this turmoil. On the other hand, the historical uh, achievement of reconciliation of Germany and Poland is under stress as well. So on the east, there's also a lot of shifting balances. So I think Germany is struggling to redefine its position, but there are so many good historical reasons for Germany not overreaching again and trying to have its European policy through the means of influencing France, Poland, Italy, the Netherlands. But it's become very, very difficult for uh, Germany. But I think it's not at all that the German uh, political establishment is now going its own way. Not at all. It tries desperately to redefine its position in Europe. I mean, I, they're struggling. I mean, it's obviously, Germany is a country I've studied for a very long time. I, I think a line gang is, 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 it's is, too is, strong. Is, is much too strong. I mean, Nord Stream 2 is a particular case where Germany clearly put its national interest before the European strategic interest. But in most other cases, they're always trying to find the European position. And if you look at you know, China, for example, which is something incredibly important for us all, actually the ch German position has become, in a sense, more European, mm -hmm. that is, say, firmer in relation to China than it was. So mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, I, I, I think they are really struggling. But, but if the question is, are they prepared, really ready to do, you know, all that much more that w would enable, for example, the Eurozone really to work for the countries of Southern Europe and enable an EU without Britain really to pull together. Well, I mean, hey, Medus. Mrs. Europe, Merkel, she's, you know, stepping back in two years' time, so we'll have to but wait. What I would like to suggest, perhaps, not so much as a critical note, but perhaps as a, an invitation to reflect a bit on what could be a possible answer. It starts for me with rethinking what populism is, and trying to understand its rational core. I mean, there's a lot of irrationality, there's a lot of psychology around. I mean, sure. But if we redefine and rethink populism as in essence being a form of protectionism, a quest for security, a quest for protection, then perhaps we can also find answers to it. Because the problem is, if you start by thinking about populism as irrationality, 
there is perhaps educational effort as, an, as a possible mm -hmm. answer, but then the conversation ends, the dialogue ends. So I would start well, let, let simply, let's, well, to well, let's just see one example. Professor Garten Ash uh, agrees to this definition. Do you agree to this definition of populism being protectionism? Because now we can move on and see if there's a way out of this deadlock. Well, Do you agree? I, I, I think it's, an, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, it's not only that, but I no. think it's a large part of it. Um, uh, and, and I absolutely, and that was also my theme, you have to go and look at the roots and try and understand where the causes are. And I think we are beginning to see a pushback. So if you take Poland, for example, a country mm. we both know well and care a lot about, where it looked as if to mark the 30th anniversary of the Velvet Revolutions of 1989, where Poland was a leader, yeah was the leader out of communism towards liberal democracy, and for a moment it looked as if it might be the leader of, out of liberal democracy to get towards into something else. Democracies. To well, if illiberal democracy exists, which I doubt, to whatever else that thing is. But actually the pushback, because illiberal democracy isn't democracy. Democracy is of liberal course. or nothing, okay? But, 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 but actually the pushback in Poland is really quite strong. There's now a, a so-called Koalicja Europejska, European coalition in Poland, standing for the European elections, doing quite well. There's a party which gets sort of 10% in the polls, run by a gay mayor of a Polish town. Mm -hmm. Who knows Poland? Catholic in that Catholic Poland? Poland? That's amazing. They mm. get 10%. You know, who talks about his party as progressive? So that. You know, there are some, some signs of hope there, and it's partly what, what Paul rightly says about understanding what these discontents are and trying yeah. to address them. And this hope, so. where does it come from? What is it tapping from? What does it look like in a translated in a political well, narrative? Um, well, so, so I think liberal patriotism, uh, understanding this need to feel that there's take back control, that your concerns are being addressed, listening, which is something Macron really tried to do very well. And then, it, so listening already addresses one of the key concerns of, of people who vote for populists. They think it's not just economic inequality, it's also what I call inequality of attention and respect. Those people mm. in London or Paris or Warsaw or Berlin, not only are they much richer than us, they don't even notice that we exist. They never write about us in yeah. their oh. newspapers, and when they do, it's a reactionary bigots. And so, okay. listening is already part of the answer, and then addressing the real issues of inequality. Yeah. Oh. So I would start with, um, you know, since it was mentioned, and I think it's one of the reasons why uh, Brexit gained a majority, also, also all research shows that it was partly about migration control, not only, but I think it could have made a difference if the, we would have better answers. So I would start there by, you know, thinking about what Macron is saying in Europe qui protège. So what is the sort of protection that Europe could offer in real terms? Not about talking about listening only and education, but simply coming up with the better answers than mm -hmm. we have been doing. Okay. So you mentioned Canada. I think, you know, it's so self-evident if you look at public opinion in Canada, it's not different from Germany or Britain or the Netherlands. The only different thing in Canada is that they have a clear idea of what sort of migration they want, clear choices, very transparent, being debated in Parliament, proposed by the government every year, a clear idea about labor migration, a clear idea of the reach of their humanitarian obligations. So if we would bring some more order into that, have more prospect, then we could defeat the forces of isolationism that turn a genuine quest for protection and migration management into building walls, into shutting us off from the outside world. So we can have better answers than we do. Because in Canada, you see, and of course Canada is in a different place geographically, but let's start by asking ourselves the question, what is it we want? Because we always start by what we cannot do. Yeah. And, but yeah, Canada is a good example, but of course it's a different, it's also a different um, a political uh, entity, of course. No, but huh? Do we so want it? Would it be a good idea to have that as a point of reference? And then we can start asking ourselves, mm. what is it we want? What is it we can do? Mm. 
and of course Europe is in a different place, but we never arrive at the point of defining what sort of policy in this regard we want. Mm -hmm. And that is why people react with a sense of take back control, because if you don't propose any orientation, then of course the backlash exactly. occurs. I mean, can I just qualify that in two respects? I think, I'm, broadly speaking, I agree with you, but number one, I mean, yeah, migration, it was a very salient issue, but if you look at the recent polling, migration is a much sal less salient issue now, so I'm not sure... In England or Europe you, in general? No, Europe-wide, Europe-wide. Yeah. Um, the, the, the height of the panic, I think, has passed, but we did... You know, I talked a lot about our mistakes, and one of them clearly was to take down the borders, the frontiers inside Europe without thinking about the border of the Schengen zone. And when I say thinking about it, I mean just exactly that. What's it going to be like if large numbers of people want to cross that frontier? What do we do about that? But if we're both saying we have to manage immigration, which means to control it, which means to keep some people out, then we have to think what we're going to do for those people as well. Of course. Right? So, so, so part of the liberal answer also has to be what do we do about the rest of the world whom we're keeping out? But, but do you, do, would you agree that there was always this idea that there cannot be a compromise between West and East on this issue of internal European mobility? You've been writing yourself in The Guardian, because I can remember that because I quoted it in my own column, <laughs> very uh, very proposing very a different regime and saying yeah. we need a new compromise. But I've been looking at the demographics of Eastern Europe, Central Europe. If you look at Bulgaria, if you look at Romania, if you look at Poland, they are fastly losing their youth, not only through internal migration, it has different sources as well, it's a broader picture, but I think a new compromise could be found to manage in a better way, you know, mobility inside of Europe, so also with looking at the interests of Central and Eastern European countries. So this is something that maybe a lot of these people don't, in this room don't quite sort of fully um, appreciate, which is when we talk about migration, there are two fundamentally different problems. With us in Western Europe, the problem is immigration. In Eastern Europe, the problem is immigration. Yeah. These are countries which have lost in the Baltic states 25%, 27% mm -hmm. of the population since they lost the EU, and often the most energetic young people. The Romanian finance minister, a few months ago, suggested that Romanians should only be allowed to work for five years in the rest of the EU yeah. and then should come back. And not not a French finance minister, the yeah. Romanian. And of course he was slapped down, it's a thing you can't say. Yeah. But it well, is no. an interesting one. But that doesn't address the problem of the people on the other side of no. the Mediterranean. And there, you know, people complain about German defence spending being so low. But what about German spending on international official development aid, right? I mean, it's a really, it's a small point, but an interesting mm -hmm. one. We have had an official target since 1969 of 0.7%. How much does the Netherlands give? I think it's now 0 0.5. 0 six or so. so yeah. Right, uh, well, that's not bad. That's not well, bad. Well, we're still uh, below the, the target. The 0 0.7, yeah. but do you know what Germany is? 0 0.4. Yeah. Nor, but I think for, for, you know, a very rich country in the centre of Europe, which prides itself on taking international responsibility. You say that is a shame. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have to. We want to go and uh, have the audience as well react Absolutely. to what you're saying. Although yes. we still don't have a clear plan of how to get out, well, but we're not doing badly. Uh, we're we're not. You're not doing badly at all. Um, before we move to the audience, no. um, it's yeah. It's no, no. it's time for Maddie for your third uh, your third performance. Maddie, please. Yeah. That's your final, yeah. Um, again, it's it's quite like a quite a big thing to work out. How do you you close an event uh, when there's still so many uh, unanswered questions uh, and threads? Um, and I suppose I wanted to go back to sort of what I spoke about at the start and uh, thinking about our desire as audience members and citizens for stories and for a clear ending. Um, and even in how we think about history, there's a, I remember being at university and um, listening to my friend who was a, a, a history student, she was like, well, at one end of the spectrum, history is just literature, which I'm sure you will have something to say about. Um, but that is, you know, something to think about, I suppose, that the way in which we will just tell stories again and again. Um, 
And so I'm going to start this story by going back to the beginning of Brexit, because I think no matter what happens, I think it's really important, certainly for British people, that we don't forget exactly why we're here. They say we don't have many venomous snakes in Britain, but I have seen them on tables in trains, under plastic flaps, and wrapped around presents for party games. Their bodies are columns, long in inches, red-topped eyes gleam above the headline, and the curve of the serif on the capital F hangs like a fang on the front page. They feed us facts until senses become deadened to deaths that don't concern us, numb to numbers that crush and crunch until they are pulp in our brains, not one of them mattering. Slow, sluggish, we become the swallowed and the swallowing, lies upon lies upon lies. Leaflets flutter through letterboxes like tongues flickering through teeth. All's fair in love and war, they say. Lies upon lies upon lies. And then internal bleeding, as red splits from red to form new cells and blood fights blue to make purple bruises on the body politic. Muscles start to spasm. Statistics start to stick in the back of your throat and choke you. Visions of millions promised on the sides of buses, hovering like a mirage in the desert, always just out of reach. Lies upon lies upon lies, and on a hot summer's night, lies. The pain sharpens its knife. Lies, and we begin writhing, waking. Lies up in cold sweats, drenched in fear. They're here, they squeal, and they're coming for your house, for your school and your job and your television, no doubt. Hysteria bursts like dye. Lies, panic rips, lies across counties. Veins pulse in red, white and blue lies and the effect has already taken hold. Swollen fears burst into the bloodstream. Toxins course to the brain. Heartlands collapse. Organs revolt and recoil. Opinions retch and splatter. Votes sway. Lies and eyes roll back to the past. To visions of England, green and pleasant at last. Lies, delirium, it's national delirium, it's pandemonium, they shriek, fitting and foaming in a tabloid trauma in this midsummer nightmare, too late to turn back now, just cut, just cut us off, throw away the tourniquet because we're done for, these shores are shoring up and shutting down, the exit wound is weeping, gasping, clasping, lies at straws, but too little, too late, the block comes down and an X is marked in a box. Once the deed is done, the snakes retreat, shuffle off that moral coil and slink back into the long grass, skins shed like duties. Years will pass, the moss will come, time will forgive and forget. They say we don't have venomous snakes in Britain, but we did last time I checked. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maddie Maxwell. This was like your second, third, and fourth performance in, in Amsterdam. Thank you. Um, yes, this is the Bali, and this is a debating center, and we like to give like the final word to the audience. Um, we've been talking about um, uh, European people, I think, in need for protection, uh, and that, that, uh, that there's this quest for identity, which results in uh, they get offered a nation and they get offered an identity, um, looking, taking a, a narrative of taking back control for granted. Migration policy is very important in that. Um, and we're eager to know uh, what you uh, have as questions for our two um, professors. Um, so please, who has a question? I have a question um, about how the left could tackle the right-wing populists. And we were recently watching a really interesting documentary about Alexandria, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the US. 
and how she basically came out of nowhere with a grassroots campaign that really tackled the sort of concerns of the local working class people, and she won the election uh, in New York. So I'm wondering if that could maybe be a way for the left in Europe to sort of counterbalance what the right is doing at the moment. Well, you being an old school leftish <laughs> thinker. <laughs> Um, I like the venomous snakes, by the way. I can think of a few. Um, so, so, I mean, I think, I think it's a really great question because, to a significant degree, it's their electorate which has gone over to the populists. So, in the first place, it's for them to try and win them back. And I think um, programs which address fundamental economic inequality, which are more redistributive, have to be part of the answer, but I think it's only part of the answer. What I actually think is that the left has not yet found the package of different things to meet all these different concerns um, that will bring back enough voters to, to swing it the other way. And I think that's actually going to take a bit of time because even if we control immigration, a lot of jobs are going to go to automation and digital platforms and so on. So what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about the real causes rather than the ones the populists blame it on? And in a way, I think we need a sort of John Maynard Keynes to pull this all together before you can get to your post-war social democracy. So I think it may take some time before we really see the pushback. Uh, but I would say it didn't surprise me that in countries with less social protection, and when I'm talking about protection, I think of a much more, much wider array of questions than immigration only. It's where I started, but there are many other areas. And I wasn't surprised to see that in Britain and the United States, contrary to all the expectations that it would be continental Europe where the great breakthrough of populism would occur, that in countries where uh, social inequality uh, measured by the Gini coefficient, I mean, it went up 10%, 10 points in the UK and Britain, whereas in Germany and in France and the Netherlands, it stayed much more stable throughout the economic crisis. So I think, yes, social protection, mm -hmm organizing it in a new way, in an area of digitalization, uh, globalization, for sure. But open economies, and that is a great lesson also of a country like the Netherlands. All historical research shows that open economies go hand in hand with large governments. So there is not a zero sum. On the contrary, you can only remain open in the long run if you protect the population against the shocks that this openness mm towards a world economy brings with it. So a country like the Netherlands, with a fundamentally open economy, has also quite a substantial system of social protection and governmental regulation. So okay. that is, for me, the quest. Okay. Beyond all these questions of uh, protectionism, etc., huh. finding better ways of regulation in an era of globalization, hmm. and we need Europe there. But I conclude you do agree with Timothy Gardner. Uh, you know, if there is a renaissance needed, is that of John Maynard Keynes? Yes, oh. but then not only at a national level. So that is our big problem. That is why I'm not so pessimistic about the possibilities of Europe coming up with better answers, because it's so self-evident that you cannot tax Google only nationally. You need Europe. There is no privacy on the internet on a national scale, but Europe can make a difference. There is no effective strategy towards 5G and Huawei uh, with China's involvement when there is not a European mm. answer. Europe has fallen short of those answers in many ways. Mm. That is why better answers are possible. Okay, thank you. Let's have another question from the audience. Yeah, Professor Gartenesch, you mentioned as one of the criticisms that's leveled at Europe from the left is that it's part of the movement towards globalization, uh, global capitalism. And I think you can argue that the European Union actually has been a tempering force for global capitalism. If you look at, for example, the levels of con consumer protection between the United States and Europe, it's night and day. Uh, so what do you think about countering that argument? No, I mean, I, I um, actually don't think that's right. I think that, you know, Eurosceptics, British Eurosceptics always hate the European Commission. 
In fact, the European Commission, in large part, has been a motor of Anglo-Saxon-style liberalisation of European markets, deepening the single oh. market. And actually, I don't think social Europe has kept up with market Europe. So I actually think that's one of the problems there. Um, so, so, I, so I don't think that's, that, that's quite right. I mean, of course, the view from the far left, from sort of Corbyn, is that it's kind of a capitalist plot about exploiting the workers, and that's clearly not true. But I think one needs to do more on the social, on the social Europe side. I completely agree with what Paul just said, that, and this is one of the big arguments for Europe now, it's not just about taking on China or Russia or climate change, if you're going to take on Google. I mean, I've had quite a lot to do with these companies, because I spend oh. three months every year at Stanford. And I can tell you, who are they frightened of? They're not frightened of the US government. That's been effectively regulatory mm. capture. They're fine. They've got them in their pocket. But they're really frightened of the EU. Oh. And that's a good thing. Good. Yeah? No, no, but that's the hopeful answer. If you look at um, you know, the, the, the challenge of protectionism, to come up with better forms of protection that don't throw away what is opening our possibilities in an era of globalization, but strikes a new balance between yeah. the needs of communities and our place in a wider globalized economy. And I think it's, we, we can really find better answers than we have been doing in Europe. So there is a real deficit, and I would always start there. It has been a great civilizational progress to open up borders, to create this huge uh, new space of freedom, but that brings with it new questions of security, of protection. And boundaries. And, um, there is where I would look. OK. Um, a final question, then? Yes. Concerns, like you talked about a lot of different challenges that you is facing from Brexit to populism to migration. But one issue that wasn't addressed is that actually the rule of law is being persistently undermined in some of our member states. My question is, isn't this even more threatening? Because they actually attack the values on which the European Union was founded. So what do you think about this? So, a couple of things. One of the fundamental problems of the way Europe has been constructed is that the Europe of values and the Europe of money are separate. The Europe of values is mainly in the Council of Europe, the Strasbourg Court, to some extent the OSCE. The Europe of money is the EU. And we've kind of tried to reverse engineer the values into the, into the EU with a fundamental charter and so on. But we haven't actually established the linkage between the values and the money so that Viktor Orban can systematically dismantle liberal democracy and the rule of law in Hungary with the aid of US, uh, EU money. It's not just that he goes on getting the money, he uses the money to buy off the oligarchs who control the media that secure him the next election. So he's actually using EU money to dismantle the rule of law. And, and, and uh, with a little protection from Manfred Weber, by the way. And, um, and that's a huge problem of the way Europe is working. Second point. Um, we shouldn't talk as if it's only a problem in Eastern Europe. And by the way, I hope we can do something about that. I hope we can actually make that linkage going forward in the next budget period so that it actually costs Orban or Kaczynski something if they fundamentally undermine the rule of law. But don't let's think it's only in Eastern Europe. So our idea of ourselves is that we're a community of law in which everyone is equal before the law. If you look at the way we handle refugees, it's nothing of the kind. There's one law for us and another law for them. It's a differential system of law. And actually, we do something awful to refugees, which is we more or less compel them to lie, to make up stories about why they're coming here in order possibly to get asylum or not. So that, you know, as well as looking at the beam in the Hungarian's eye, we might look at the speck of dust in our own. And the last thing I want to say, since I guess this is the last round, right? This yeah. is the last round? This is the last, yeah. Is this. I mean, you know, we've both been quite critical for the last whatever it is, hour and a half. But let's remember, this is by far the best Europe we've ever had. 
if you told any previous generation of Europeans for a thousand years, if you just described to them what today's Europe was like, that it's a community of liberal democracies who are in the same political, economic and security communities, that you can get up on a Friday morning, decide to fly to the other end of Europe, meet someone there you like, settle down, live, study, work there. I mean, this is absolutely amazing, even to someone you know, if you told that to someone in the 1980s, they would have found it amazing, let alone the 1880s. So that we don't need constantly to be making the argument about how, oh, Europe has not yet reached the finality or PN. It hasn't yet done these great things. You know, the, there's a green election poster in Germany which says, Perfect ist Europa nicht, aber es ist ein verdammt guter Staat. Mm -hmm. And if you think about this, this is such a peculiar thing to say. Would we say the Netherlands is not perfect, but it's a damn good start, or France is not perfect, but it's a ridiculous thing to say. You know, Europe is already there, we're in it, and it's a huge achievement. And if we could only just d defend what we've achieved over the next uh, decade or two, it would be a tremendous achievement. So, so I just wanted to say that at the end, it's the best Europe we've ever had, and we need to stand up and defend it. Thank you. That's a beautiful final. Before we say goodbye, we've been like European citizens all in this together tonight, but what tomorrow night is on is a battle between London and Amsterdam. So what will your prediction be? Um, I'm, I'm a rugby man myself. Okay, so? <laughs> so I'll say Amsterdam will win. Really? <laughs> and since Paul, and since Paul I will, know nothing about it. And Paul will agree. Well, I've been to Vienna right. for the 1995 uh, final of AC Milan against Ajax. I've been uh, quite a supporter in the last 50 years. So, so tomorrow night you'll be in the arena. Don't think that I'm going to betray them now that we have a possibility to go to another final. So of course it Easy will be a very difficult match. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll see and watch that tomorrow. For now, thank you so much for this um, enlightening discussion. Thank you in the audience. We hope to see you back again and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you.